microphones oh. find their way to you. <laughs> Hello. I have a question for Rasmus and Frederick. Uh, just here. I was wondering uh, if you're looking at models to look at how much of the city should be transformed in order to uh, promote things like biodiversity, because maybe there's a critical point where if you have enough green space or enough uh, structured green space, because also not all green stuff is the same, I'm sure, as you know. Um, and sh should a lot of that be centered around native species as well, because you know we have uh, a fear that you know introducing non-native species might also lead to worse problems like these Chinese mushrooms or something. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's an... Uh, uh Brilliant question, I, and uh, people often think that when you go out as a as a, a Dane or a, a French guy to to the international market, you you bring your unique knowledge. I'm going. To, we have projects in China, we have projects in France, but we always learn something. What you have here in Paris that we need in Copenhagen is a biodiversity plan. We don't have a biodiversity plan in Paris. You also have a mayor that were given the task by Hidalgo to work with urban farming, biodiversity, green spaces, changing all the cemeteries into biodiversity. And so, yes, it matters. And of course, there's a political level where we need to solve the crisis of the world, but I honestly believe that cities are the answer. There's C40 right now in my hometown, Copenhagen, because all the major cities is where people are. So we need, that is where there's shoulder from action, uh, you know, from discussion to action. So I believe the cities take uh, a, a huge importance in this, and yes, it has to be native species. Great question. We have our next question here. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Professor Vivian, for a very good, interesting introduction and presentation. And then I come from Shenzhen Institute of Building Research, and I'm glad to see that you use one picture of our buildings. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, I think the very useful from the financial and environmental and human capital benefit framework. And I just wondering how to connect our environmental serving sunlight, health and productivity connected with the building and how to build up the modeling and to get the data and to set up the indicators. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a very tough question. Obviously, everyone's trying to figure out how do we show the health impacts. I, I do think that the, uh, and Lisa uh, Heshang mentioned this morning that uh, there, there are certain environments where we actually do track human health, such as hospitals, and to some extent schools, because we track uh, children's asthma rates, we track a whole series of things relative to absenteeism and, and uh, different types of uh, flus and colds. So there are some environments where there is a natural database. It's very hard in the, in the white collar office to track uh, the physical environment that impacts health. But it's a really important question and it's, it's gonna require that the building owner community and the leadership of, of different building sectors actually be um, uh, actively involved in uh, studies engaging health outcomes. Thank you. Other question? Yeah, uh, coming to Christoph. Good to see you, Christoph. And uh, I, I like the idea of you have to uh, catch the moment of decision, which is a uh, major decision are, have a, can be taken in a very small window, and we have to bring at that moment the key strategy. When I conducted uh, uh, some similar study, but less ambitious than what you've been doing, there were two issues we, we popped out, is the view more than daylight, actually. We, we found out the view was more correlated than daylight. I wanted to know your opinion about that. And, and the, uh, the fact also that in the value, the speed of selling, that daylight was an accelerator of sales. You know, real estate don't like to have apartments that don't sell. And the, the one that sell faster are the one with view and daylight. So speed is also on top of the value. So I wanted to know, uh, have you looked at these aspects, or are you, are you planning to look at these aspects? Yeah, we, we're definitely going to look at view next. Um, as I said, that's partly due to an absence of good view metrics that are available right now. We looked at the one for LEED, and um, I think that why the study worked pretty well is that in Manhattan you have so many spaces that don't have any daylight, so you, you capture basically that effect. 
we were a little disappointed that when you go from the, um, in the upper two echelons, there's hardly any difference between 5 and 6%, uh, I would say that's noise. So uh, if you look carefully at the data, you see a peak uh, of buildings that have 100% daylight autonomy. And I think these are the buildings where view will be a great discriminator. And there's been some really interesting work uh, from KPF, for example, on looking at view in New York and how to shape a building with that. And this is what we're gonna, gonna tackle next. In terms of the program in here, this were mostly office buildings, so we didn't get any data on retail or something like this. But maybe one interesting thing that I didn't mention during the presentation or didn't point out, actually uh, having a lead credit or not didn't give you any benefit statistically significant for these buildings. Hello, I have a question to the team of Sherti Delix. Uh, after we talk about, you, you explain, thank you for the presentation first of all. Uh, after you talk about nature, about uh, daylight of course, and about air pollution, what do you think about noise pollution? And uh, what do you think it's, if it's relevant to put the high residential building on the top of the mm -hmm. periphery, which is one of the most alive air, uh, highway in, yes. uh, in Paris? What do you think that it's, what is your solution with the problem with the high rise residential building? Thank you. Uh, yes, you're right. This was, this was really a huge question about. Uh, the noise regarding air pollution and noise pollution. But we think that the peripheric now, uh, for example, two years ago it was like 80 kilometers uh, per hour that you can drive. Now it's 70. We are really convinced that um, it will really become a urban boulevard very soon. And so this question of sound, also now we have thermical car, we know that we have more and more electrical cars, we, we, we think that this, this is going to change. I mean, this infrastructure has to evolve, and we think that this is really good that now uh, architecture is not backing this infrastructure, but really take care of them, and so that this can really be an evolution. We don't think that we should destroy the periphery. There is a lot of stuff in, in Paris that we say, okay, this, this is harmful, we have to, to, to put it down. We think that this is very important to keep it for the circulation and everything. But it has uh, to evolve to something that is really much less polluted for much more bicycle, electrical cars. So I think this is... Uh, we, are, we have to face it right now. But I think in the next decade, it will really be something different. And we, we think you, you, we, uh, you can live in, uh, in front of the periphery in, in 10 or 15 years. This will be possible. I just have one, and one comment. So sound is a wave, s scientifically. But it's actually also psychologically. So if you are in a pleasant environment where you can hear birds, it's scientifically approved that you can actually feel less annoyed about the cars. So one of the solutions is that all the politicians start to do green, nice environments in all the cities, because then you actually don't feel the noise as much. Well. It's also part of it. I think it's an important message to bring. So I think we have time for one more question. Do we have over here? Um, hi, my name is Eva Wang from uh, Yuan Wang Studio. In Shanghai, I have a question for um, both Sebastian Vivian and Chui Kai uh, on um, active house design. Also, this uh, uh, zero carbon or 100% passive architecture, the urban context, and the scale of the projects and the government policy. How do these elements influence the design? Because China, I, I worked in Chicago for 10 years, and then I worked in China for another 10 years. <laughs> so uh, it's a totally different environment, especially for European architects coming to New York. Besides, you got the mayor's <laughs> uh, green lights. You know, the scale is quite different. Small project, I think it's easy to control, but uh, for um, mega scale, like the last project, Cui Kai, um, presented, you know, this kind of uh, hopscotch we call urban complex. How do we, as architect and urban planners, to apply all the, the green strategies to these um, mega scale projects in different uh, urban environment? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, one of the things we discover uh, is uh, for um, 
on your scale, if you're just touching a building size or any kind of, it's very easy today to do a close to zero energy building just by the envelope design and a bit compensation. We discovered that is not the target, that's just one very first step. If you are capable to do that without extra cost, even fully glass, I know Termission is going to say the contrary, but we can do it. Then, as soon as you go to a city block scale or a larger scale, we saw it would be co more complicated, and with the practice, we see it's the opposite, actually. The larger the scale you have, it's more easy to compensate. This is why that permaculture, permacity concept that some part of the buildings with a local district can feed another and so on. So it's a we think it's very easy to say any new development, whatever it is, should at the least have zero impact and to see how they can, in a resiliency concept, to evaluate, to regenerate it. So then you have to integrate it all. But on the larger scale, really, it's easy. Then it's the climate, because since we were in this part of Europe, everything is easy, it's quite smooth. When we arrive to Kinshasa, it's all year long like a sauna or, or, or hammam. It's 80-90% uh, humidity all year long. Night cooling is not working there, so on. So this is climate strategies that you have to use. But again, some are so um, easy to use as, you know, we learn architecture from follows function, and we should come back to from follows climate. And <laughs> everything is there, you just have to take it. It's too so easy. Yes, just to complete, because at urban scale, you can use more parameters like mobility, but also if you have, uh, in a urban scale, if you have housing buildings, but also office buildings, they don't have the same needs. So sometimes the needs are the opposite. Sometimes you need heating in ones and cooling in another ones, and so you can you can use strategies to compensate one and another. So it, this is why in a urban scale for us, most of the time, it's easier to achieve uh, carbon neutral or even regenerative design. Last word for yeah. you. Okay, just Rachel. there. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the, for the uh, different scale of the uh, of the uh, design, uh, dealing about uh, the urban development, I think uh, is uh, uh, a new uh, trend in China. Uh, for the new developing area like the uh, Xiongan. And the uh, sub-center of the Beijing is uh, the government want to pr promote the sustainability uh, of the city. So uh, they asked the older design teams to do that that way. And uh, another direction is uh, dealing about the existing uh, uh, city, the how to improve the environment. So it's a lot of things uh, happened. Now uh, the architects can do uh, with the landscape with uh, ecological uh, uh, Spencer, uh, so we can do uh, step by step. I think yes. Uh, in China, the uh, problem is that a political reason the the, uh, the 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 government officials change, so, so the decision will change. Another big issue is about uh, the price, the cost. So it's uh, too expensive. So it's not uh, uh, can uh, can practice uh, this way. So it's uh, we. Normally, we'll find some of the balance. So all the direction is uh, very clear. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so uh, we'll, do, we'll hold our applause until after Michelle gives us some in introductions and about our next steps. Yeah, so uh, I had promised one hour for lunch. Now we have to reduce it slightly because <laughs> no, but that's about one hour. That means we, we come back for the breakout session at 2.40. Uh, when, when you are eating, there are some small tables, and you are all polite and shy. Don't be. We, we don't have that many tables, so don't be afraid to mingle around and, and match with the people you don't know. And we expect uh, each table to be filled with at least six people. That, that's what I've been told. So I have not seen the size of the table, but, but try it. <laughs> that, that, that will be good. So thank you once again, uh, and I think now we can really applaud these uh, these great speakers. Thank you very much.